Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Today I will discuss the rigidity that can occur when two groups act geometrically on the same space. And this is joint work with Daniel Woodhouse. So to start with the definition, we say that a model geometry for a group G is a proper geodesic metric space on which the group G acts geometrically, meaning properly, discontinuously, and co-compactly by isometries. So for example, every finitely generated group admits infinitely many model geometries because the group acts geometrically on any Cayley graph constructed with respect to a finite generating set. As a special case relevant to this talk, the free group acts geometrically on a bounded valence tree. And as a third example relevant to this talk, the fundamental group of a closed hyperbolic n-manifold acts geometrically on hyperbolic n-space. So each of these actions are geometric and each of the spaces are model geometries for the corresponding groups. This project concerns the following three notions and their relationships. First, we're interested in understanding when two groups, G and G prime, have a common model geometry, meaning that both groups act geometrically on the same proper geodesic metric space. By the Milner-Schwartz lemma, this implies that the groups G and G prime are quasi-isometric. The converse fails in general, and it's related to the third notion, which is algebraic. We say that groups G and G prime are abstractly commensurable if they contain finite index subgroups that are isomorphic. And because any finitely generated group is quasi-isometric to any of its finite index subgroups, if two groups are abstractly commensurable, then they are quasi-isometric. The four missing implications in this diagram fail in general, and examples will be given in this talk. But first, the two notions of rigidity we're interested in. First, in blue, we say that a group G is quasi-isometrically rigid if any group that is quasi-isometric to G is abstractly commensurable to G. So that's the existence of this blue arrow. And in red, we say that a group G is action rigid if any group that shares a common model geometry with the group G is abstractly commensurable to G. So in both cases, algebraic information is deduced from geometric information. So note that by Milner-Schwartz, if a group G is quasi-isometrically rigid, then that implies the group G is action rigid. The converse is not true. And we're interested in families of groups that are action rigid but are not quasi-isometrically rigid because these give examples of quasi-isometric groups that have no common model geometry. So groups for which the converse to the Milner-Schwartz lemma must fail. Okay, so first two examples, previously known examples of quasi-isometric groups that have no common model geometry. So they do not act on the same space geometrically. The first such examples are given by Moshe Segev and White. They considered the following family of virtually free groups. Let GP denote the free product of the finite cyclic group Z mod PZ with itself, where P is some prime, at least three. Then these groups contain free groups as finite index subgroups. So there is one quasi-isometry class and one abstract commensurability class within this family of groups. However, Moshe, Segev, and White in 2003 proved that the groups GP and GQ 
have a common model geometry if and only if the prime P is equal to the prime Q. So if and only if the groups GP and GQ are isomorphic. And these were the first groups, first examples of groups that are quasi-isometric that don't have a common model geometry and the first examples of groups that are abstractly commensurable but do not have a common model geometry. And note that this obstruction disappears after passing to a finite index of groups. These groups virtually have a common model geometry because any two free groups have a common model geometry. As a second example of groups that are quasi-isometric but cannot act on the same proper geodesic metric space, it's given by simple surface amalgams. So here you fix some K at least three and take K surfaces with negative order characteristic and exactly one boundary component and glue the surfaces together along their boundary component to get one singular curve. And uh, the amalgam is just the fundamental group of this space. Then if you fix K, if you fix the number of surfaces, there is one quasi isometry class among all such fundamental groups and there are infinitely many abstract commensurability classes where the commensurability class depends just on the list of Euler characteristics of the surfaces in the amalgam. So a simple surface amalgam is not a quasi-isometrically rigid group. And in previous work with Woodhouse, we showed that these amalgams are action rigid, meaning that a simple, if two simple surface amalgams, G and G prime, have a common model geometry, this happens if and only if the groups G and G prime are abstractly commensurable. So because there are infinitely many commensurability classes inside of one quasi-isometry class, you have groups that are quasi-isometric but cannot act on the same proper geodesic metric space. And it's not known if these groups virtually have a common model geometry. Conjecturally, they don't, but our proof used that there was just one singular curve. So other than the results I'll present today, these are the only examples we're aware of of quasi-isometric groups that cannot act on the same proper geodesic metric space. So let me say a little about the proof, the strategy of proof for these two examples, and that will sit in comparison to our newer work. So the proof strategy in these examples to show that there are quasi-isometric groups that cannot act on the same space has two steps. The first step in both examples is to promote the common model geometry. So meaning, suppose that two groups in this family act geometrically on X, a proper geodesic metric space, then you want to prove that these groups both act geometrically on some other space that's much nicer with much more structure. So you can promote this common model geometry and then step two, which is more special to the class of groups you're thinking about, is to then use this model geometry to obtain additional information, like these groups must be isomorphic or they must be commensurable. Okay, so two examples. First for these virtually free groups studied by Mosher, Segev, and White the free product of finite cyclic groups. Mosher, Segev, and White prove that if two virtually free groups act geometrically on the same proper geodesic metric space, then in fact, those groups act geometrically on the same tree, on the same bounded valence simplicial tree. So that's the natural model geometry for these groups, and you can show both groups act on the same tree. And that's really helpful in this case because the only tree that the group GP can act on geometrically is the Bastier tree associated to this free product splitting. So that's the p-valence tree. So the groups GP and GQ cannot act on the same tree geometrically, and therefore they can't act on the same space geometrically. 
Simple surface amalgams have many natural geometries associated to them. And with Woodhouse, we showed that if two simple surface amalgams act on the same proper geodesic metric space, then they act on the same two-dimensional cat zero cube complex that has a very um, sort of natural tree of spaces decomposition. And this is helpful because we could really analyze the structure of the Q complex and its automorphism group. And we could show there's some subgroup of the automorphism group that contains both simple surface amalgams as finite index subgroups. So um, there's some nice subgroup that of the automorphism group that acts properly and co-compactly on the cube complex containing both simple surface amalgams. Okay, so in the <clears throat> more recent work, we studied the class of free products of closed hyperbolic manifold groups. And first note that the fundamental group of a closed hyperbolic n-manifold is not quasi-isometrically rigid, and it is not an action-rigid group for all n at least three because there are groups that act on hyperbolic in-space that are not commensurable. So you can't deduce algebraic information from either quasi-isometry or from having a common model geometry. And to summarize the goal of the rest of the talk, I want to explain that while free products of these manifold groups are not quasi-isometrically rigid, the free products are action rigid, and thus you get groups that are quasi isometric with no common model geometry. Okay, so to be more precise, we study the following class of groups that C denote the family of free products of groups H1 through HK with possibly a free group, Fn, where K is at least 2 and N is at least zero, so there may or may not be a free group on this free product. And each group HI is the fundamental group of a closed hyperbolic NI manifold for some NI at least two. So free products of closed hyperbolic manifold groups. And to remark that we really take C to be the set of infinite ended groups in which each one-ended vertex group in the stallings dunwoody decomposition is a uniform lattice in the isometry group of a rank one symmetric space. So the point is that torsion is fine in this theorem. You can think of orbifold groups and that their real hyperbolic manifold groups is not important. One, impo one step of our proof is to apply previously known rigidity theorems, which holds for uniform lattices in any rank one symmetric space. So we do use that their manifolds, but we don't use that their real hyperbolic manifolds. Okay, so first I want to explain that a group in this class is not quasi-isometrically rigid. And that falls from the following results. So first, the quasi-isometry classification for free products was given by Papa Soglu and White in 2002 for general finally presented free products. And they prove that if two groups in this class, for example, are quasi-isometric, that happens if and only if the quasi-isometry types of their one-ended factors agree, ignoring multiplicity. So for example, on the slide, free products of any um, finite collection of surface groups are quasi-isometric. And in general, you just have to keep track of the set of dimensions that occur in the free product, not how many times this occurs. So there is a lot of flexibility in creating quasi-isometric groups from free product constructions. Okay, so this is just keeping that theorem of Papa Sogol and White. Within every quasi-isometry class of these free products of closed hyperbolic manifold groups, there are infinitely many abstract commensurability classes. 
if there's a manifold in the free product of dimension at least three, then this falls from um, classic commensurability results. And there's also an argument of white in dimension two that generalizes um, to all groups in this class to prove that for every group there um, in this class, there are groups quasi isometric to it that are not abstractly commensurable to it. So in other words, every free product of closed hyperbolic manifold groups is not a quasi isometrically rigid group. However, we prove that there is rigidity if you require these groups to actually act on the same space. So that is, we show that every free product of closed hyperbolic manifold groups is action rigid. And to recall, that means if G prime is a group and G and G prime act geometrically on the same proper geodesic metric space, then the groups G and G prime are abstractly commensurable. And so, as a consequence, we have the first examples of the following. There are quasi-isometric groups that do not virtually have a common model geometry. So this obstruction can't disappear after passing to finite index subgroups. And the corollary follows because this class of groups is closed up to passing to finite index subgroups. So for these groups, the converse to the Milner-Schwartz lemma fails in a really big way. The converse to this theorem fails. It's not true that um, commensurable free products of manifold groups always have a common model geometry. And that follows from the next results. We obtain additional rigidity if the free products you consider have exactly two factors and both those factors are surface groups. So let's G and G prime be free products of the fundamental group of closed surfaces of genus at least two. Then the groups G and G prime have a common model geometry if and only if they're isomorphic. And as a consequence, we have the first examples of torsion free abstractly commensurable groups that do not have a common model geometry. So in other words, having a common model geometry is not a transitive relation, even among torsion-free groups. And to give one explicit example, the commensurability class is determined by a work of white, who proved that two free products of surface groups are abstractly commensurable, if and only if they have the same other characteristics. So, on the slide, the fundamental group of the wedge products on the left and the fundamental group of the wedge product on the right are abstractly commensurable groups, but they do not have a common model geometry. They can't act on the same proper geodesic metric space. Okay, so before explaining what goes into the proof of these theorems, let me present two open questions that we're very interested in. So suppose that H and H prime are one-ended hyperbolic groups. Then the first question is, is the free product of H and H prime action rigid? So if G is any group that acts on the same space as this free product, does that imply the two groups are abstractly commensurable? So we, we know just the case that H and H prime are manifold groups. And what turns out to be a related question, suppose that these one-ended hyperbolic groups, H and H prime, act geometrically on the same contractible simplicial complex. Does that imply that H and H prime are abstractly commensurable? And again, we know this for manifold groups, but um, it's open in general. And to remark that it's false without the hyperbolicity assumption because Berger and Moses give examples of infinite simple groups that act geometrically on the product of two trees. 
Okay, so let me explain what goes into the proof of the action rigidity theorem. It follows the same strategy as the previous two results. We first want to promote the common model geometry to a nice space, and then we want to use this to obtain um, additional information. The groups must be commensurable. So just to recall the previous two examples, the virtually free groups, you can promote the common model geometry to a tree. And for simple service amalgams, you can promote the common model geometry to a Bezier square complex. And in our setting, for free products of closed hyperbolic manifold groups, the first step of the proof is to promote the common model geometry to a tree of copies of hyperbolic end space glued to each other along intervals in some tree-like fashion. So that's the you know, standard model geometry for one group, and you can promote an arbitrary common model geometry to this nice one. And here, the second step of the proof is to get into the situation where you can apply symmetry restricted latent theorem, which is a new result of Garden, Woodhouse, and Shepard that proves that certain lattices in the automorphism group of a tree are commensurable. So let me explain the two parts of this proof in a little bit more detail. Okay, the first step, just to state it a little more precisely, we want to promote the common model geometry. So suppose that G and G prime are free products of closed hyperbolic manifold groups. And suppose that they act geometrically on X, some proper geodesic-metric space. Then in this situation, we show that the groups G and G prime both act geometrically on an ideal model geometry, which is a space built out of copies of hyperbolic end space and trees glued to each other along intervals and points. So to prove the existence of this promoted model geometry, the main work is to find a common simplicial model geometry. So we really make use of the following results, which holds in more generality for um, infinite-ended hyperbolic groups. Okay, so let G and G prime be hyperbolic, infinite-ended, and not virtually free groups. Then if the groups G and G prime act geometrically on a proper geodesic metric space, then the groups G and G prime act geometrically on a simply connected simplicial complex that decomposes as a tree of spaces where the vertex spaces are either one-ended or a point and edge spaces that are intervals. So we promote the, the model geometry to a simplicial model geometry. And to remark, the main work here is to find the simplicial complex, because since these groups are hyperbolic, you can apply the Ricks construction to obtain a simply connected simplicial complex. And once you're there, you can apply Dunwoody's tracks to obtain the tree of spaces decomposition. So the work in this theorem is really the simplicial complex. And let me also remark on the three uh, uh, hypotheses on G and G prime. So first, the case that the groups G and G prime are virtually free is due to Moshe Segev and White. They prove that if two virtually free groups have a common model geometry, then those groups act on the same tree. So the result holds and was already known to work of Moshe Segev and White. This result is false if you remove the infinite-ended assumption because there are, because incommensurable hyperbolic manifold groups cannot act on the same simplicial complex. So we're really using infinite-ended in a big way. And the last assumption that is hyperbolic, we think we can remove in joint work in progress with Sam Shepard and Daniel Woodhouse. We are looking to prove action rigidity 
outside the hyperbolic setting. And again, the first step is to um, upgrade the theorem by removing the hyperbolicity assumption. So it looks like we can do that. OK. And um, but for this theorem, we use hyperbolicity because the main tool in the construction was the structure of the visual boundary of these groups. OK, so once you have this simplicial complex model geometry, to obtain this ideal model geometry built out of copies of hyperbolic end space, we then can apply rigidity theorems of Tukia, Hinkanen, Markovich, Chow, and Pansu to equivariantly remove the one-ended simplicial complexes and replace them with copies of hyperbolic end space. So let me now explain why this promoted model geometry was useful. So first we can reformulate the goal topologically. The goal being that we want to show if two groups act on the same space, then they're commensurable. So now that we have this nice ideal space both groups are acting on, then the two quotient spaces, y mod g and y mod g prime, are now compact graphs of spaces that are built out of met closed manifolds, points, and intervals. And to prove that the groups G and G prime are abstractly commensurable, we just want to prove that these compact graphs of spaces have homeomorphic finite sheeted covering spaces. Okay, so what's the difficulty in this problem? The, the difficulty in finding common finite sheeted covers. So there are kind of two opposing forces. On the one hand, if every manifold in the compact graph of spaces was just collapsed to a point so that you have two compact graphs with isomorphic universal covers, then the existence of isomorphic finite sheeted covers falls from Leighton's theorem. And I'll say more about that in a minute. But on the other hand, if the spaces y mod g and y mod g prime were just single closed hyperbolic manifolds with isometric universal covers, then you cannot determine, you cannot um, conclude that they have isometric finite sheeted covers because they're incommensurable hyperbolic n manifolds in dimension at least. Okay, so our um, result shows that for these graphs of manifolds, the situation is much closer to the graph case than to the pure manifold case, in part because these manifolds have marked points. And the work is to get into the setting where you can apply symmetry restricted latent theorem. So let me explain what that theorem says and why it's useful to us. So first, um, latent theorem from the early 1980s proved that if two graphs, two finite graphs, gamma and gamma prime, have isomorphic universal covers, then the two graphs, gamma and gamma prime, have isomorphic finite geodic covers. So note that this isn't enough for our situation because we need to keep track of the manifolds assigned to each vertex. So we need a generalization of this theorem. And to state the generalization, let me first rephrase Leighton's theorem. Right now it's written topologically, so algebraically, we'll, um, Leighton's theorem says the following. So suppose that T is a bounded valence simplicial tree with co-compact automorphism group. So that corresponds to the universal cover of these two graphs. Then any two free uniform lattices in the automorphism group of the tree. So those are corresponding to the fundamental group of the graphs. Are these two free uniform lattices are weakly commensurable in the automorphism group of the tree. So to recall, that means there exists some conjugating element in the automorphism group of the tree that conjugates one lattice so that its intersection with the other has finite index in both F prime and the conjugate. And this intersection realizes the isomorphic finite index of groups. Okay, so this just is keeping Leighton's theorem on the slide for comparison. T 
from now on is a bound advanced co-compact tree. And Leighton's theorem says free uniform lattices in the automorphism group are weakly commensurable in the automorphism group. Symmetry restricted Leighton's theorem is a generalization proved by Gardam and Woodhouse and independently by Shepard. So the start is the same. You take two free uniform lattices in the automorphism group of the tree. But now suppose that they're contained in a symmetry restricted subgroup H in the automorphism group of the tree. Then you can conclude that these lattices are weakly commensurable inside the symmetry restricted subgroup. And it's exactly H that allows you to keep track of additional information associated to the vertex groups. Okay, so let me define what is symmetry restricted and what's an example, simpler example. So you say that a subgroup H in the automorphism group of the tree is R symmetry restricted if H is equal to the set of elements in the automorphism group of the tree so that for every vertex of the tree, there's some element of H so that the element G and H agree on that, on an R ball around that vertex. So H has to be equal to the set of elements that at every vertex agree with H on that vertex, but the elements of H could vary as you vary across the tree. So I, I don't know if the definition is the most illuminating, but it's also very, very broad. It's very difficult to give examples of subgroups of the automorphism group of a tree that are not symmetry restricted. We know proofs that they exist, but I don't know a simple construction of one, which would be very nice. But to give a, an example of a symmetry restricted subgroup, maybe the easiest example is to consider T to be a colored tree, then the color preserving automorphism group is symmetry restricted. And so, for example, symmetry restricted Leighton's theorem recovers the previously known result that if two colored graphs have isomorphic colored universal covers, then they have isomorphic colored finite sheeted covers. So here again, you're allowed to attach extra information to the vertex groups that you want to preserve when passing through finite sheeted covers. So an application of this new theorem was the final step of the proof for us. And the challenge is to get into the setting where it applies because it, it requires that you have two groups acting on a bounded valence tree freely. And um, to get into the situation, we need a series of covering space arguments. Okay, so thank you very much. I'm very happy to answer any questions or confusions during the conference.